In the spring, I so look forward to watching my little sugar snap peas poke up out of the ground. It is so nice to look forward to having some fresh peas to pick from my garden every spring and also in the fall, especially in the spring because it's usually been a very long, cold winter. My children love it, so it's something that, you know, children and adults love. They are easy to store. I like to freeze mine. And of course, they always find their way into some kind of dish like a stir fry or uh, a Thai red curry. I like to make a wet curry just where they're just swimming in a coconut sauce. It's just so good. And if you too like sugar snap peas, then you are well aware of the cost of them. About three dollars will get you eight ounces, a half a pound of sugar snap peas. And you know that they don't even compare to the flavor of when they're fresh picked from your garden. They are so sweet and just bursting with flavor. And so that is one of the reasons I enjoy growing them every year. So I would like to show you how I successfully grow peas every year. I've grown them in two different climates, I'm in zone 8B and now I'm in zone 6B, which is much cooler. And I think you have to keep in mind two important things, the variety that you grow and also the time that you plant them. These are two things that can really affect your harvest every year. Now I like to grow the sugar, the sugar snap pea and um, I will sh tell you in a few minutes which variety I like the best but basically you have to choose between which kind of peas you want to grow so you have these that are called snap peas and then you also have snow peas the snow pea is grown more for the pod and it has tiny little peas on the inside and then you have the shelling peas which sometimes people call these English peas and you grow those mainly for the pea inside and not the pod whereas the sugar snap is grown for the pea in the pod, and that's why I like it. And the kind that I like to grow is called a super sugar snap. It's not just a regular sugar snap or sugar ant or anything like that. It's called a super sugar snap. And I have grown at least 10 different varieties, and I found that this one outperformed all the others. And uh, as a matter of fact, I went ahead and threw away all my other seeds because I was so disgusted with them. And then there were some shelling peas in there. And so I just threw away all my other seeds. And now the only thing I grow is the super sugar snap. And the way I like to store my seeds is in a produce drawer in the refrigerator. We have an extra refrigerator, and this is where I store all of my seeds. I'll just mark the top of a mason jar with a piece of scotch tape, and that's what keeps them nice and fresh so I can grow them year after year. Your pea seeds should last about three to four years. Now we're going to look at when to plant. Um, I do like to refer to this book here. It's called the All New Square Foot Gardening Book. It's just a quick reference, very easy. If you're a new gardener, just kind of give you a guideline um, when you should plant things. And here we have what's called a last spring frost date, and that's different for everyone. So what I will do is leave a link in the description area so you can determine when your frost date is. We have two frost dates every year. You'll have a spring frost date and a fall frost date. The spring frost date is generally just going to be when your temperatures uh, in your area are expected to start warming up. And so after the last spring frost date, which is just an average date, um, your area should not experience a frost. So a lot of times when you plant your vegetables, you will plant those um, either around that date. So for peas and your cool season vegetables, I like to go out about um, seven to eight weeks beforehand and um, I do three different plantings. My last one will be about five weeks before my last spring frost date. And I also plant them in the fall and I'll do that about 10 weeks before my first frost date for the fall. Now I like to do what's called direct sow my seeds um, and that's merely you just put them in the ground and you plant them that way and you water them. I have experimented before with transplanting them. So I started them indoors and then I moved them outdoors and into my garden. So I did uh, two things here. I wanted to compare the results of transplanting them into my garden and also direct sowing them. So um, these were the, here's a picture of where I uh, transplanted them from indoor growth. And then in the other bed, I also direct sowed some. I had direct sowed those several weeks earlier, and they were both kind of about the same uh, growth. 
So a few weeks later, um, I compared the growth again. And as you will see here, the ones on the left were the ones transplanted, and the ones on the right were the ones that I direct sowed. Again, a few weeks later, you'll notice the ones that are closest here to the camera. Those were the ones that I direct sowed, and they are already producing blossoms. And then the ones in the back were transplanted. No blossoms as of yet, but they did end up producing fine uh, by harvest time, which is usually the first few weeks in June. So based on this experiment, I only direct sow my seeds from now on because it is just so much easier. It's so much easier just to put seeds in the ground and water them in versus doing all that work of transplanting them. It's just a lot easier to direct sow your seeds. So the planting schedule that I follow for me is usually around the end of February, I will uh, plant out my first planting of 16 to 24 seeds. And then mid-March, I'll do 16 more. And at the end of March, I'll do 16 again. Usually, um, my February planting and my mid-March planting come up at about the same time. Usually, when you look on your seed packet, it'll say like 64 days to maturity, or it might say 58, something like that. That is a guideline to when you should be able to start harvesting that pea after it has germinated. And we'll talk about germination in a minute, but those seeds are not going to germinate and pop up out of that ground until the ground hits a temperature of around 40 degrees and they'll start to germinate quicker as it warms up. So this is an example here on June 10th of the seeds that I had planted at the end of February. They are producing very well at this point. The vines are getting actually kind of a little bit old. I've already been harvesting at this point for almost um, three weeks. Okay, and this is the planting from mid-March. Okay, it's almost caught up with the growth of the other one. And this was the planting from March 30th. I do like to have different types of vines growing, different ages of vines, because I think that the newer growth has a lot more flavor. So that's why I stagger my plantings. Um, just so that when that old vine, the one I planted first, starts to slow down, it starts to get leathery and old, I've still got some new growth coming in in the garden with a lot of flavorful peas. And that's what's called also succession planting for those of you who are new to gardening. Um, it can kind of be a tricky thing when you're when you're brand new to gardening, but it's called succession planting, and that's what gives you a, what's called a continuous harvest. Now, like I mentioned, you can also grow them in the fall. Here is here are some peas I had growing um, on October 6th. All right, so now we'll look at plant spacing. Most of your seed packs are going to have very good directions as to how you should plant your seeds. I don't typically plant in a row. I plant in squares. So um, I re usually refer to this book if I've forgotten how many I need to put per square and it'll tell me right there. The spacing for peas is eight per square. I have found this to be very good information and they grow great at eight per square. Now like I said this book here is just a general rule of thumb, a quick reference. It's not none of this information is carved in stone. For instance you'll he see here on the right um, it does not recommend that you start your seeds indoors, but of course, as I just showed you, I have started my seeds indoors and moved them outside. I do think that that method is good for people who maybe have a very small space garden and they want to make sure that every inch in their garden has something growing in it. For instance, here, um, as an example, on March 30th, it had just snowed that morning. The snow had just melted. And you can see that at this point, I have probably uh, about 25% of my seeds have come up and the other ones are working their way up, but I usually have about an 80% germination rate. So if I were trying to take up every single inch in this little square foot area by direct sowing, I have some spaces that are going to be empty there. But if I had transplanted them into the garden, then all those spaces would be taken up. Okay, so now we're going to plan the garden. I like to grow a three season garden. So my spring garden oftentimes overlaps with my summer garden and my summer garden overlaps with my fall garden. So this takes some preparation and planning ahead of time. Now this is a picture of my garden on May 10th. May 10th for my area is when we uh, 
plant out are things like tomatoes and peppers and other summer crops. So what I have to be cognizant of in spring when I'm putting my peas in the ground, my shallots, my onions, and broccoli, I have to be aware of areas in my garden which may experience some shade uh, as the deciduous trees, in other words the trees that have lost their leaves over the fall and winter, as those start to fill in in the summer, they're going to cast going to cast shade onto my garden. So a lot of times I like to put my um, spring plants uh, there, and then I leave my nice sunny areas for my summer plants. So this garden looks half empty, and that's because it is. It's empty purposely because I'm saving room to put my tomatoes and peppers in there. I also have to be aware not to use up all of my trellises for peas. I have to have plenty of support for things like my green beans and tomatoes and that kind of thing. Another great way to plant your peas is in a container. So one year I decided to give it a try and I took a round container, I think it was about a 12 inch container, and I put a tomato cage in the middle of it or a pepper cage which was also round. And I put five or six peas on the inside of the cage and I planted lettuce and carrots at the base. And it worked out really nice. The peas just grew right up and over the cage. So I had to put a little pole in the middle so they would have something to grab onto. If you decide to do something like this as well, you'll need to make sure to put your peas on the inside of the cage so that they don't fall outside. They need something to grab onto. And you just work the little tendril right onto the little poles and they'll just grab on. It's a lot of fun to do it that way. And that brings me to making sure that you provide adequate support for your peas. I have found that you're going to need about five feet of vertical trellising to support your peas. So I'll show you three things that I use. This is called a net trellis and it's made of nylon. You can get them on Amazon and I'll leave a link in the description area if you'd like to check that out. Um, they're pretty inexpensive. You just tie it up between two poles and the peas love it. Also, I use this for cucumbers after I pulled my peas out, so my summer crop also gets to use it. And so when your peas are starting to come up out of the ground, you'll just um, work them up onto your trellis. That's important so that they know to start growing up into that. It's a lot harder to do that once your plant is mature, so I do that when it's very young. You can also use arches, and I'll include a link in my description area where you can check out how to build your own arch too. If you use an arch, you may need to put some string on it as well, so you'll need to give a little bit of extra um, support there. You may also need to tie on with some Velcro straps or something to give your peas support. So as your vines start to produce peas, they're going to become weighted down, and they can break, so you want to make sure to provide support. I guess my favorite trellis are the little iron trellises like this. They're real easy to work into the ground and you can just pick them up and move them throughout your garden. And I like to do that especially because since I grow three seasons, I have a lot of peas that require support in the spring, but on May 10th I move my tomatoes into the garden which also need support, but they don't usually need support until about three weeks of growth. And then, at that time, I've usually started pulling out my peas, you see, and then I can use that trellis and just go and pick it up, move it over to my tomato plant, and then it has support. So, I do like having my trellises um, be mobile throughout the garden so I can just move them around. Okay, let's look at harvesting. I like to harvest my sugar snap peas at this size right here. I don't like the pea on the inside to be too big, and I don't like the pods to be big and tough. And so this is an example on May 24th um, when my peas just start to come in. Right when I see that they're at the size that I want, even if it's just two or three on the plant, I'll go ahead and pull it off and I'll put it in a bag. And then you'll notice that about three days later, you'll have to do that again. You might have six you get off. You may not even have enough for one serving your first week when you start harvesting. But go ahead and get those off of your plant because this is going to tell your plant to start producing. And when it decides to start producing, it will produce. You're going to have a lot of peas. So when you're harvesting, um, don't just look at eye level. You're also going to need to squat down 
and get down there and look up underneath those leaves and see um, if there's any peas down there. You don't want old peas on your vine because they're going to be real plump and they're going to turn yellow and they're going to be tough and leathery. And it's also going to send a signal to your plant to slow down the production. So make sure you get all of your peas off, even down low. So when you're harvesting your peas, go ahead and clip just right above the pea where the little blossom was. This will help keep your peas fresher until you can cook them or put them up um, for freezing. Now we'll talk about watering. It is very important that once your peas start producing that you water them every day at the soil level. The best way to water at the soil level is to not use a water can that has the spray on the end. You want something that you can direct right down at the soil. You don't want to spray your leaves with water. Watering your leaves can cause disease in your garden, so you'll want to water at the soil level. For instance, here I'm watering some oregano, and I'm barely touching the leaves, and I'm directing that water down to the soil, and that's what you want to do with your peas. So what I like to do is when I'm harvesting my peas is I will put them in a bag and label them with the date that I picked them because once they start coming in about every uh, two days I'm going to have a pound of peas and I don't want to cook up my fresh ones first or give away my fresh ones first. I will go back and look um, and try to work with my dates. Obviously you want to go ahead and um, use your oldest ones first. So that's how I like to store them. And now we'll look at problems, insects, and pests. Okay, peas are not problem free, and I'll show you some of the things I've experienced over the years. Now, if you've had a problem growing peas in the past and they don't grow well for you, you might need to inoculate your seeds and soil. This is something that some gardeners just swear by, and I've never done it. I have um, very good production, so with beans and peas, so I not something that I feel that I need to do. That might be something that you will want to look into if you've ever had a problem with the growth. Now, I like to grow what's called the super sugar snap pea, as I've mentioned. And this particular pea is resistant to powdery mildew and leaf roll virus. Powdery mildew is a very common problem for anyone that grows peas. If they've had a problem, and most likely I've seen that it's powdery mildew. When you go to order your peas, regardless of whether it's a sugar snap pea or a shelling pea, on the website where you're buying your seeds, there is usually a reference of some sort to tell you what kind of disease resistance that seed has. So you can usually look at that and find out, you know, if you've had a certain problem growing peas, you'll want to find something that's resistant to that problem. Okay, so now insects. So one of the insects that love peas is the pea aphid. And I've not had a problem with pea aphids before, but if you notice stunted growth on your peas or wrinkled up shriveled small leaves or just an infestation like this, um, you have a problem with aphids. And I understand that a lot of people can control aphids by spraying them off with water. Now I um, personally, a few years ago, I just tried to attract as many beneficial insects to my garden as possible and I let a lot of aphids just infest some broccoli that I had in my garden so that I could um, attract beneficial insects. So I just kind of let the insects do their thing. Well right here, it is a beneficial insect and I wanted to see if you can identify it. Right there is what's called a lacewing. It's not the immature insect that eats the aphids, but it's the larva. And so this is a very good insect to have in your garden. And then something that I'll have a lot of in my garden are hoverflies. And these are very easy to identify because of their flying pattern. They will hover as a matter of fact, he's sitting there just staring at me as I'm recording this video. <laughs> and then they will fly in an erratic pattern, darting back and forth. The hoverfly is a good little insect to have in your garden. It looks like a very tiny bee. Um, they lay eggs inside the plant tissue, and that larva eats aphids as well. So the, the fact that I saw both of these insects on my um, peas meant that there may have been some aphids there, but I didn't have a problem. It could be that it was nipped in the bud by the insects. You'll see here laying an egg right there in the pea vine. 
So I guess one of the most disappointing problems that a gardener can experience is when an animal has visited their garden. Fortunately, I do not have deer, but this damage that you see right here was caused by a rabbit. They will go down and just munch off the sugar snap pea vines. They like those, <laughs> along with many other things in your garden. If you see damage like this in your garden where something's been chewed off, like down here in the left corner, the broccoli has been chewed down. This means there has been an animal in your garden. And once they have found a source for food, they will come back. So it's very important that you nip that in the bud. Your garden can be gone in no time. And fortunately, I don't have deer in my area. But uh, one nice thing is I do have some neighbors outdoor cats that visit the garden and they'll take off some of these rodents that like to eat things out of my garden which is great you know little cats are great for that um, I have found that also trapping uh, animals is good this is a little animal trap we got from Harbor Freight and I put some cabbage in there cabbage is great carrots and stuff never worked for me cabbage was great and we just trapped them it takes about two or three days They'll go right in there, and when you see them in there, you can just take them off and relocate them somewhere else, <laughs> away from your garden. <laughs> now for the fun part, we get to use them in our kitchen. So hopefully if you have followed all of these steps, you will have enough for freezing and enough to use fresh. So first I'll start by showing you how to freeze them. We're going to blanch them first, and you'll want to wash them and trim them. I'll leave a link at the end of this video so you can see how to trim your peas. And so to blanch your vegetables, you'll need to make an ice bath first. I like to use my pasta pot for this. This keeps the ice cubes separated, but the water ice cold. And then on another pot, I will boil some water, and I'm just going to add my peas to the water. I'm going to toss them around for about a minute and a half. What we're doing here is we're stopping some enzyme activity in the pea, which causes the pea to decay. So by stopping the enzyme activity, um, our peas will be nice and firm in the freezer and not mushy. If you didn't do this, your vegetables will come out mushy, okay? So once you've boiled them for about a minute and a half, then you can transfer them to your ice bath and you'll want to cool them down. This will take several minutes until they're ice cold and this is stops the cooking. And then you can put them on a paper towel, make sure they're nice and dry, and then you will transfer them to a, some parchment paper on a cookie sheet. I like to freeze them overnight, and then the next day I'll transfer them to the final place, which is a Ziploc bag. Now my favorite way to eat peas in the spring is just to steam them for just a couple of minutes and then drizzle them with some salt and butter. But also I like to, in the fall, use my frozen peas for stir fries and um, when they're fresh too, you can put them in stir fries, of course, or I like to make a wet Thai curry where they're just swimming in coconut milk. That's probably one of my most favorite things to make later in the fall. And then also, before I pull my peas out in June, when the vine has slowed down, I'll take the tips off and I'll pull the leaves off and you can use these for sauteing. So this past spring, I made a dish with uh, sauteing them with some tarragon and some bacon, and I just put it on a piece of toast um, with some bacon crumbles and a poached egg and some other herbs. And it was very nice. I really enjoyed that. So hopefully you can have a wonderful harvest of peas this year too. If you enjoyed the video, I'd like to ask you to share it on your social media. That would help me out a lot. And again, thank you so much for watching and have a beautiful day. Bye-bye. Donna Tayton from America. We're calling you now, baby. <laughs>